Hello and welcome to the Health Evolution Collective. Today we are talking to accredited practicing dietitian Jessica Turton from Ellipse Health. So Jess uh, did a talk recently at the Low Carb Lifestyle Long Weekend called Addressing Your Physiology with Nutrition. So I have attached um, at the end of our chat today that talk. So if you missed the summit and you haven't seen it, you can go ahead and see that fantastic presentation. Um, so today, Jess and I just chatted for about 25 minutes on some of that content, really just understanding, you know, nutrition in terms of nutrients and what it gives our body, the physiology of what our body needs to be healthy. Um, so that's what we talked about today. Now below, you can access um, Jessica directly if you would like to get in touch with her. She has an online program, which might be helpful if you're interested in and learning more about this. And I've also included the podcast chats that Jessica and I have had on the Health Evolution podcast if you're interested in checking that out. So grab a coffee, sit back and enjoy the chat that I had with Jessica Turton. Hi Jess, thanks for joining me today on the Health Evolution Collective. Thank you for having me Tracy, lovely to be here. Always lovely to chat to you. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about your amazing summit presentation um, that you did called Addressing Your Physiology with Nutrition. So what people are going to be able to do after our little chat today is see that um, presentation that you did. It was one of the most popular presentations, uh, most watched presentations of the summit. And there was so much in there. So thank you for doing that, by the way. Um, and, you know, I was hoping you might be able to answer a few little questions that I had around that, just to put a little bit more context around it and then people can go ahead and, and watch what you did. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So can I just start with, I guess it's a, a big picture question, um, but probably narrows it down somewhat, but what does it actually mean to address your physiology with nutrition? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a big picture question. Um, so basically what I mean there is that, you know, we all have our own individual needs and requirements, right? So underneath our body, we have all these physiological processes, right? Like within every single cell, we have all these things that are going on. And I don't think people realize so much because we're so disassociated from what we are in a way and health and things like that. But every single little physiological process in your body requires a nutrient or 10 nutrients or 20 nutrients. Um, so, you know, nutrition is really the fuel for our body and the structure of our body as well. And because we all are doing such different things on a day-to-day -day basis, we're asking our body of different things. You know, we're all under different levels of stress. Um, some of us have injuries or illnesses that we've got to deal with where you know, different ages, different sexes, and that all means we have different nutritional requirements um, based on how our physiology works. So really what it means is having a think about what markers you can use to track your health and to track your physiology. So I'll give you some examples. Um, blood tests like vitamin D, for example, a really simple way to track your vitamin D status. Um, but you can also do metabolic tests. You can also use your weight. You can use your energy levels. There's so many different outcomes that reflect how your physiology functions. And then making nutritional tweaks to improve those outcomes. And that's really what addressing your physiology with nutrition means. And that's how I work in my practice. Okay, so that's interesting because one of the other questions I had here is does this look different for everyone or is it different? So is there is there a broad um, similarity with everyone in terms of, well, we all have a central nu a nutrients that we need and, um, you know, carbs, fat and protein all work the same way in our body. But within that, there's a huge variation. If I understand your question correctly, we do have, um, so basically there was a whole bunch of research done and this is actually pretty good nutrition research. So this isn't dietary guidelines stuff. This is like way back before then when they started doing the first nutrition research studies, which were like identifying vitamins and minerals, um, like figuring out if you didn't have vitamin C, you would get scurvy, for example. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have this base of research, which kind of tells us the minimum amount of nutrients that each of us, that all of us need, sorry, or most of us need. Um, and that's what you generally find um, like in the nutrient reference values. So they're things like uh, recommended daily intakes and adequate intakes, like those sorts of values you see, like you should aim for um, 500 micrograms of folate, for example. That's just a, a value that they've used um, based off research studies they do have to sort of work out what the minimum requirements are for good health and prevention of disease. Um, some people need so much more than that, right? So it really depends. For example, if you are someone who sweats a lot, you need a lot more magnesium than someone who doesn't sweat a lot. And just like really simple things like that. So I think we mm. have this really good science that tells us what nutrients are essential and roughly how much we all need, which is a great framework to base our recommendations on. But then for the individual person, we absolutely have to take a lot of different factors into account and then try to figure out, okay, well, what are the nutrient requirements of that individual person? And that's really hard to do. Mm, it's not mm. easy. So I don't ever expect people to be able to know this stuff themselves. Um, you really do have to dive deep into the literature behind all the nutrients and figure out what increases people's requirements and what decreases people's requirements and so on. Yeah, so interesting because... You know, one of the things, one of your messages in your talk was, you know, you were saying how it goes far beyond fats, carbs, protein and calories when it comes to achieving your health goals. Yet I see um, predominantly this sticking to a certain number of macros every day in terms of what people eat and trying to follow some standardised guidelines when it comes to low carb or, or anything like that. But I loved what you were saying around that. So can you just expand a little bit more on what you mean there? Yeah, so um, not a lot of people really do know the fundamentals of nutrition because uh, we're not really taught about that. I think if you do PDHP in school or food sciences in school, you might learn this. Um, but we tend to see foods as food groups. That's how it's promoted, like breads and cereals and fats and oils. We don't often see foods as essential nutrients, like what does our body actually need? And so we have our macronutrients, which are carbohydrates, fat, protein, and alcohol. And those macronutrients give our body energy and they do certain things in the body, depending on which macronutrient we're talking about. Um, but within food, we also have essential micronutrients, which are vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids as well. And these don't give us energy, but they're absolutely essential for our physiology. Um, so if you did chemistry back in school, you'll know that there's different, um, there's different ways to make up different proteins and different ways to make up different enzymes. And usually you'll find nutrients in there, you know, that we are made of nutrients and proteins and things like that. And so these vitamins and minerals, are they don't give us energy. They don't help us put on weight or, or, or anything like that. Um, but they're essential for how we function on the inside. Mm, mm, very interesting. And yeah, I agree. I don't think a lot of people do do really understand that. And one of the quotes that you said in the talk was nutrients, nutri nutrients are the ingredients of your body, just kind of like you said there. And, um, you know, taking off all the labels and all that other stuff and breaking it down to, well, what are the nutrients that our body really needs? And what are the foods that are going to give me those? I think it helps to give a lot of clarity around what we, we should be eating um, you know, each and every day, because it is confusing. There's just so much conflicting information out there and we don't have your level of, you know, knowledge around this. So, you know, if we go and sit there and Google, what do, what should I be eating for a healthy diet? I mean, gosh, we're going to get so many different opinions. And Well, it, it shouldn't really be 
I don't know how to phrase this right, but what I'm trying to say here is that <laughs> with the research that's being done in terms of our nutrient requirements, most of the time the research is done in healthy populations, right? So if we are completely 100% healthy, you know, living in a stress-free environment, nutrition probably isn't that complicated, right? Um, but because we have all these stresses on our system, which are promoting nutritional deficiencies um, and our food environment is confusing and void of nutrition, that's why it's so complicated. So, you know, a lot of the times people will say to me, for example, like, why do we need, you know, why do I need X supplement? If I've recommended a supplement, for example, they'll say, why do I need that? Like, how would we have gotten supplements 200, 300 years ago? And the mm. way I explain it to them is that we live in a completely different environment now, which is changing our nutrient requirements. And I usually work with people who have multiple chronic diseases. Um, and especially gastrointestinal diseases, and those people aren't even absorbing their nutrients from food. So, yeah, it is really confusing, um, but for the general healthy person and for our kids, it can be really simple, you know, focusing on foods that are real foods, right? Like it can really help us get our nutrients in, but when you're taking into account the levels of complexity that come with chronic disease and come with the modern environment, yeah, it, it does get really tricky to optimize your health. Mm. Yeah, it does. So where do we get these, you know, essential nutrients from? Now, I know you sort of said eating real foods, but, you know, I think even real foods can be, un, you know, confusing. You know, what is a real food? I saw a post by a dietitian the other day. Um, wasn't someone that I follow, but, it, you know, in, in Instagram, it comes up with recommended people. And, you know, she'd done a post on bread wholemeal bread and you know explaining how it was so healthy for you full of protein full of nutrients um you know what was the other you know we kept a level low level of blood sugar every day well you know not sort of stuff that i mean i would agree with but you know also not stuff that you know people in the low carb field would agree with either yet you know they're saying <laughs> something completely different so is is bread a real food you know is it where how do we know what's a real food and what's not yeah <laughs> it is it is hard to answer that question because everyone has a different definition of what's a real food as you've highlighted mm. um the reason that a lot of people consider bread and cereals to be real whole foods is because they are part of the australian dietary guidelines so we have been thought to eat uh, we, we have been taught to think they're essential, you know, they're an essential part of the healthy diet. Um, but what not a lot of people talk about is that that breads and cereals food group is uh, the way that they make bread, for example, is they essentially strip the grain of all its nutrition. They take away the vitamins, they take away the minerals, and then they add them back in synthetically after the bread has been made or when it's in a particular stage. Mm. Um, so they're literally taking away all the nutrients that were naturally present in the grain and then putting synthetic versions of that nutrient back in. So to me, that's not a real food anymore. You're basically supplementing at that point. Mm. So it's... Um, it's misinformation, I believe, to say, you know, we must be having bread to get our folic acid, for example, um, because that folic acid is actually synthetic and not a lot of people can metabolize synthetic folic acid. So, you know, it's OK if people want to eat bread, but we really need to um, be upfront and say this isn't a real food. You know, this is how it's being made and these are the, the nutrients you're getting. They're not actually in the food. We've supplemented it. So in that situation, you can kind of flip it and you can say, okay, well, what is a real food? What does actually have real nutrients in there? And it hasn't been fortified and it hasn't been enriched with synthetic vitamins and minerals. Um, and so we can take, for example, a piece of meat. So a piece of meat or an egg or fish, you know, most people can identify that that hasn't been processed in a way that has had ingredients added that weren't naturally present. And we could live solely on animal foods, which would mean that we're getting all the nutrients we require. 
So as long as someone has animal foods in their diet, they can meet a lot of their essential nutrients. Um, and then that's not to say that vegetables and fruits and dairy don't provide nuts and seeds as well, don't provide nutrients because they absolutely do. And then it comes down to what is a sustainable diet for someone. And then we can talk about variation. We can talk about bioavailability and things like that. But I think that if we just try to keep it as simple as possible, what is real food? Least processed foods are real food. So if you can identify it, if it hasn't been manipulated in any kind of way, apart from maybe some mechanical processing, it's a real food. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So um, just one thing that you said there, so, you know, from animal foods, we can pretty much get all the essential nutrients we need. What about all plant foods? If we just eat an all veg, like a vegan diet, can we get all the essential nutrients that we need? No, no, <laughs> we can't. Um, so you would have to supplement. So, I mean, mm. the thing, that's the thing. We have to take individual preference into account. Um, for some of my patients, when I tell them that, you know, I usually give a food list and I often say to them, like, these are the most important things, which is generally the animal proteins. Um, and then everything else, like what we said before, the veggies, the nuts, the seeds, you know, they're add-ons, they're extras. You can have them or not have them, take them or leave them, whatever. And for a lot of people, that's really liberating. Like, mm. oh, I didn't realize I didn't have to have this mountain rainbow salad on my plate. <laughs> Um, and so it's freeing in a way for some people. It's like a relief. Um, you know, it's more convenient if in some senses. Mm. And for other people, it's the complete opposite. You know, mm. if you say to them, base your diet on animal foods um, and there's a lot of foods that, you know, we don't necessarily want to include, whether that be grains, uh, cereal products and like processed food, things like that. And then you can see, okay, well, hang on a second. If they don't eat animal foods, can they actually meet their essential nutrient requirements just having a limited range? And oftentimes they can't. So that's why you do have to bring in fortified foods. Um, so for mm -hmm. someone who is plant-based or vegan, something like tofu that has been fortified with vitamin B12 actually becomes a pretty important source of nutrition for them. Um, so, you know, if that's someone's preference to do that, then that's fine. You know, that's just how we have to work to construct their diets. But in that sense, you know, they're not necessarily eating real food because they're having to rely more on these processed foods yeah. to get their nutrients. But I honestly believe that if we can get all our essential nutrients in, even if some of them are synthetic, we can live a really healthy life no matter what our dietary pattern is. Yeah. I think it's just interesting that, you know, the way, I guess the perception that the plant-based diet is the healthy diet when really, you know, it's, it's not, it, you know, it suits agendas, but people don't realize if they do go down that track that they are missing out on essential nutrients. And, you know, of course we know people that have been, you know, gotten quite sick from doing it over extended periods of time. And then of course there are, you know, vested interests and in people like, and groups like the World Health, Health Organization who recently just tweeted, you know, saying again, we need to stop eating meat to save the planet and save the world. And it's, you know, like there's no talk. There's, you know, I don't know. It's just so many mixed messages. It just doesn't give people the right information to make the right choices. And I know, of course, you know, when we talk about food, it gets very um, personal um, and there is a lot of judgment and ideology around it. but what I love about your talk and what I love about what, how you, you talk, you, you know, the information that you provide is it brings it down to physiology. I yeah. mean, it brings it down to what our bodies need. And, you know, eating shouldn't be something that we have to feel guilty about if we eat meat versus plants or, you know, there's so much to consider with all of that. And just one thing, is bread high in protein? <laughs> <laughs> Um, unless you have a bread that's been like enriched with protein, protein. somehow. Yeah, but and, not your run the, of the mill. No, I mean, the other thing that you really have to take into account there is 
high relative to what, right? So like yeah. your version of high protein might be different to mine, might be different to someone else's. And a lot of dietitians and health professionals are using the Australian Dietary Guideline, um, nutrient reference values, whatever they are. I spoke, I speak about some of them in my talk mm -hmm. um, to base their recommendations. So one of the uh, recommendations I brought up was the protein requirements. And the nutrient reference values say that we need 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight um, in protein per day. Mm, mm. And for someone, you know, kind of like average height, average weight, that could be around 50 or 60 grams of, of protein, um, maybe 70 or 80, you know, just somewhere in that range. But that doesn't take into account additional uh, things that someone has going on. So for example, if you have arthritis, you have a higher requirement for protein because when you have inflammation in the system, that increases uh, your sort of, it increases catabolism. So your breakdown of proteins is higher. Um, and so many people have arthritis, especially as we get into older age. So if we're restricting protein or not increasing protein because we're just aiming for the standard recommendations that are given to the population, we're going to miss out on potentially preventing that um, decline in our health that comes with arthritis, you know, that physical decline. And not a lot of people are told they can do something about it, right? It could be as simple as having like an extra bit of protein on your plate. Um, but also things like autoimmunity. So mm -hmm. autoimmune conditions come down to the gut lining. Is your gut lining leaky or is there a lot of gut integrity there preventing things from getting into your bloodstream that shouldn't? And everybody forgets, but our gut lining is just made of protein. <laughs> and so if we're under eating protein, then of course our gut is going to be leaky. Um, you know, our body is going to try and conserve that protein and it's going to start, you know, it's not going to be able to heal the gut. If it doesn't have extra building blocks, so to speak, for what it actually mm. needs. Um, so in terms of is this high protein, like if someone had autoimmune disease and they were getting their protein through bread, I would say that's not high protein. That's not even adequate for you. But if we take uh, someone into account who's perfectly healthy, they're young, they're insulin sensitive, maybe, yeah, some bread could contribute to their protein and be just fine. Okay, great answer. So you touched on there, um, but, uh, not there, but I think but just before about bio bioavailability of nutrients as well, because it's not, you know, it's not just um, the amount of protein that you consume, whether it's plants or animals, it's also how, how readily available the nutrients in those foods are in your body. And is there some uh, foods that are more bioavailable than other foods? And is that an individual thing? Like, is that something that, you know, I might, my body might do better than yours? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that last part, you know, whether or not it's individual based on, you know, can one person absorb plant proteins better than another person, for example? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can definitely say that if you have an impaired um, GI system, gastrointestinal system, then those less bioavailable proteins and nutrients, um, and usually they are like the synthetic nutrients that like man-made nutrients that have been fortified to foods um, or plant proteins, they are less bioavailable than animal proteins. If you're someone that has gastrointestinal issues or inflammation in the GI tract, then you won't be able to absorb those things as well. You actually can't absorb most things as well. So it's better to get bang for your buck and choose the bioavailable sources. Um, in terms of what is a bioavailable nutrient, essentially when we eat foods or when we take supplements, our body is only absorbing small amounts of that. And so like, for example, if a steak has 30 grams of protein, you're not necessarily absorbing and using 30 grams of protein. Um, the same as if a supplement has like 1000 IU of vitamin D, you're not necessarily getting all of that, right? 
So the bioavailability of how it not only absorbs, but then actually gets used in your system is different depending on the form of the vitamin, mineral, protein, whatever it is, and then also what it's consumed with. And now it starts to sound mm, super confusing. Mm. <laughs> um, but long story short, really simple, animal foods are more bioavailable than plant foods. Whole food sources are generally more bioavailable in terms of their nutrition than processed food sources. And where it gets really tricky is the interaction between plant foods and animal foods. So if you're someone ha who has this beautiful whole foods diet that has both plant and animal foods in it, then the question is, well, is there some sort of nutrient reaction happening with any of those foods that you're having together? And I'll give you a common example. Um, if you have steak with spinach, then potentially the oxalates in the spinach reduce your absorption of the iron in the steak. Now, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So is that a problem? So then it depends on context. If mm. you are already iron deficient, then yes, that is a problem because your iron requirements, if you're iron deficient, are much higher than someone who is not iron deficient. Um, so it, it depends on context. Now, some people have a particular genetic disorder, which means they store too much iron. And in those people, it is good to have spinach with your steak because then you're reducing the amount that it's absorbed. So that's why context is so important. And, you know, is, is it bioavailable? Is it not bioavailable? It does come down to individual requirements again. But I think that even when I hear myself saying this, you know, it sounds all really confusing. Um, but if we're just talking about, okay, we take the broader picture, we step back and we say, what are the most bioavailable sources of nutrition? We're going to those minimally processed foods because they usually contain the natural vitamins and minerals, not the synthetic ones. Yeah. Um, and they're usually in a form that our body can absorb and use. Yeah. So what would be your top five of those types of foods? Nutrient dense foods. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So probably an egg, a whole yeah. egg would be number one. Um, number two, oh, let's not, let's not put them in order. Let's have, it just, no, no, no. Okay. Just your, your five <laughs> favorite. <laughs> one, <and> then, <laughs> um, cause you could live on it, live on an egg, eggs really. Um, mm -hmm. so you could eat eggs and nothing else and you could thrive. And so the eggs have all the nutrients, all the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, the fatty acids that your body needs to function and thrive. So wow, that, that's amazing. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew they were powerhouses, but I didn't realize that. So that's why if you are, excuse me, if you are a, a vegetarian and so you eat eggs, then you're much more likely to be okay than someone who doesn't eat eggs. Yes. Yeah. Right. For all my vegetarian clients, I try to get them to aim for four eggs a day because it just yeah. helps them tick off all their essential nutrients or a lot of their essential nutrients. Um, and well, even people who aren't vegetarian, you know, I try to get them to include eggs a certain amount a day or a certain amount a week. And that's why what you're alluding to before about these statements that come out from the World Health Organization or whoever it is that tell us to limit these foods. Like there was a limit on eggs. I think it was like less than six eggs a week or something. Mm, I know. And lo a lot of my patients still adhere to that. And it's so, so terrifying because eggs really do have all the nutrients we need in a bioavailable form. And so a lot of these patients I'm seeing that are restricting eggs are also having nutrient deficiencies, um, especially, as you said, people on more of a plant-based diet where egg is probably more a predominant source of nutrition for them. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry. So, and <laughs> <laughs> eggs, liver. Yeah. Everyone loves liver. Fish, um, eggs, liver, fish, red meat. Eggs, liver, fish, red meat. Oh, eggs, liver, fish, red meat. Red meat. Mm. 
need. You could do very well just with those. Mm. But what I, if I had to survive on five foods, if we're rearranging mm. the question, if mm. I had to survive on five foods, I would pick those four and I would pick avocado. Okay. Because I you might say coffee. Oh my God. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, avocado. Because avocado has a lot of potassium, a lot of vitamin C, a lot of magnesium. And for people who do well with fiber, it's quite a high fiber fruit. Mm. Um, so, you know, a lot of us do, we do fall into a state of, um, dehydration or electrolyte deficiency where we're on a low carb diet and something like including an avocado with your meals can be a really good way to boost up magnesium and boost up potassium um, and look there's other ways to get those for sure you can get those in the bones of animals like edible bones from fish um, but yeah they would probably be my top five foods fantastic well and was there anything that you wanted to say before we finished um, I guess what I want to say is it, it is very, um, it can seem very complicated. So a lot of patients come in and they're just confused and overwhelmed. Like if you go onto Google and start typing something in yourself, you know, whether it be what is a healthy diet, you know, just something so simple or what foods have vitamin A and you just type things in, you get so much contradictory and confusing information. Mm. Um, so it's okay to feel confused and it's okay to feel a bit overwhelmed. This stuff isn't supposed to be easy. And that's why I do think it is beneficial for people to either join a support group or get a health professional or get some level of support so that they can sort of bounce ideas off together and talk through the information that they find online. You know, what actually applies to me as an individual mm -hmm. and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's well worth, I mean, every single patient that comes to see me, we do a comprehensive set of blood tests. So any, any outcomes that we can track, we, we identify and we see, you know, do we actually need to supplement this person? Do we need to change their intervention according to their blood biomarkers? A lot of people in Australia are so deficient in vitamin D. Um, they're so deficient in magnesium. They, they're so deficient in iron, you know, it's just insane. And so I highly recommend if you're struggling with your health, go get a comprehensive blood set, um, blood test done, and then speak to someone about how you can formulate your diet and supplement interventions. And then from there, it's easy. You know, it's once you kind of have the, the framework and you know yeah. which nutrients are a priority for me, because you don't have to think about every single nutrient that's under the sun. You just need to know what are your main priorities. And if you are eating real foods, if you are including animal foods in your diet, then it's easier to get all the nutrients you need just by including those foods. That's fantastic. And you yourself, have you still got your food freedom program running? Yes, yes. yes. So we awesome. give some like really basic resources to make what seems like a really confusing thing more simple. Fantastic. Well, there will be information below for anyone interested in checking that out. And of course, Jessica, uh, you can find her through Ellipse Health. And uh, I believe you do online consults um, as well as face to face. You're in Sydney, you're allowed to see people, not like us in Melbourne. We're not allowed to see anyone. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've been consulting face to face this whole time. So, great. Yeah. Good. It's been good. I do telehealth as well, though. So, yeah. Um, for those people in Melbourne that need it. But but yeah, it's good. I mean, it's a lot of people think that they should know this stuff. They should know everything about nutrition and health, like as if, um, you know, it's a requirement. But we're never taught this stuff. So it's okay not to know. Like, it's okay not to know what the ingredients of your body are. Um, mm. But, you know, speak to someone, find a source of support that you trust and get that information that you need. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Jess, for coming and chatting to us today and everybody else. You can sit back now and enjoy Jessica's talk from the Low Carb Lifestyle Long Weekend on addressing your physiology with nutrition. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Tracy. 
Okay, hello everybody. My name is Jessica Turton. I am an accredited practicing dietitian based in Sydney, Australia. I work with clients one on one to help them apply low carbohydrate nutrition in the context of something called medical nutrition therapy. Medical nutrition therapy is really about doing a full holistic and comprehensive assessment to figure out what someone's top one to six nutrition related priorities are. Um, so it's kind of like a nutrition related diagnosis. So I've spent a few years now working with hundreds and hundreds of clients trying to figure out what their main barriers are to achieving their goals. And I've learned some extremely interesting things along the way. And what I've really realized despite my love and passion for low carbohydrate nutrition, it goes far beyond just carbs, fat, protein, and calories when it comes to really changing your health and really achieving your health goals. So I do want to share a little bit about what I actually mean today in terms of what I find to be a lot of people's main nutrition related problems. I think our focus is very much on carbohydrates. Are we eating too much, too little, fat, too much, too little, protein, too much, too little, and the same with calories. But I'd like us to really shift our focus away from calories, so to speak, and away from macronutrients and towards essential nutrients that our body needs. When we are dieting, we always just wanna place restrictions on ourselves and take things away from our plate. But I haven't found that to be effective, particularly in the long term. I mean, anyone can lose weight with calorie restriction, but can you sustain the calorie restricted diet and does your health actually improve when that's the type of intervention you follow? Speaking from personal experience, if you don't know my story, I have been sucked deep into the toxic dieting cycle. And I spent many years, many years balancing restriction and excess. It was one diet and then I'd fall off the diet and I'd go through a stage or a period of binge eating. So it would go from you know, rigidly controlling everything I was eating to losing control. And I just couldn't work out why I couldn't stick with anything. You know, why was I failing? What was wrong with me? Why didn't I have willpower? And yes, helping my body burn fat for fuel really did help me get out of the toxic dieting cycle, but so did addressing my physiology. And so I talk a lot about the concept of food freedom, which really means breaking free from the toxic dieting cycle and having a strong and healthy relationship with food. And step one to achieving food freedom is in addressing your physiology. And that comes with nutrition, not medications. So let's dive into this. And if you have any questions on the topic, please feel free to get in touch. All right, so think about these statements for a little bit and think about whether or not you can relate to these scenarios. These are quotes from some of my patients. I feel like there is a smoke haze over me. My brain isn't working right. I just don't feel like my normal self anymore. My stomach is all over the place. I feel like I react to everything these days. I have no idea what to eat now. No matter what I do, I just keep gaining weight. I force myself to eat less and less every day only to end up tired and hungry. I have a love-hate relationship with food. I'm always craving chips, lollies, and chocolate. I try so hard to resist, 
but it's like my body needs them. I'm sure so many people listening can relate to these statements. It's not as if these statements are uncommon. Unfortunately, they're not. So many of us are experiencing gastrointestinal upset every time we eat. It's making us fearful of food. We're cutting things out of our diet left, right, and center because we're not sure what's triggering it. So many of us are experiencing super strong food cravings. So strong, it makes us question our willpower and question whether or not we can actually do this. Can we achieve our health goals when we have such strong cravings to eat these foods that we're trying not to eat? And weight. Of course, with weight, it's so hard to lose weight. And it's easy to forget that when you see so many people online losing 10 kilos, 20 kilos, 30 kilos, 50 kilograms in a matter of months. And you're thinking, why can't I do that? Why is it that every time I look at something with carbohydrates in it, I gain weight? Maybe it's a nutritional issue that you're dealing with. Maybe it's something much deeper than what you've looked at before. So you've probably used the iceberg effect for many of your analogies in the past, but I think it really is quite important here. When I do my nutritional assessments with clients, I tend to spend the first 40 minutes or so just asking questions about how they live their life and what symptoms my clients experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Because those statements that we listened to just before are so powerful and they mean something. They're not just things that are normal, because I think a lot of those things we pass off as being normal because so many ex people experience them. Or we blame ourselves, as I said, you know, what's wrong with me? Or I just can't lose weight. That'll just never be something I get to achieve. And we kind of just accept with, accept it as being normal or health professionals tell us it's normal. Like, oh, you know, it's normal to be tired at your age or it's normal to be gaining weight at your age. You're just going to have to eat less and move more. And they make it sound like it's so simple. But what if your health challenges were not problems that you had to put up with, but more of a check engine light that something in your body needs fixing? And even better, something that's in your control. So these symptoms are not normal. They are symptoms of something much deeper going on. So I want you to think about nutrients as being the ingredients of your body. When we're going through the shops, you know, a lot of us are spending time picking up the food products off the shelf and checking the ingredients. I know I do. I spend 50% of my day reading ingredients lists for clients and helping people figure out whether or not it's a food they want to put into their body. And for myself as well, of course. And so I want you to think of your own body as having an ingredients list. And the ingredients list is comprised of essential nutrients that your body needs to function and thrive. So these would be essential proteins, essential fats, vitamins, and minerals. So this is a low carb conference. Notice that we don't actually have essential carbohydrates or essential sugars or essential fibers. These nutrients, though a lot of people um, sort of talk about them as being things you must get every day and things that comprise a healthy diet. I'm not saying they can't comprise a healthy diet, but they are not essential nutrients. They are not essential ingredients for your body. And I think that's where prioritization becomes so important because when I'm creating my list of the top nutritional issues for my clients, I have to put them in order of priority. And 
we need to think about what is the most important set of nutrients that this person needs and let's focus on those first. And then we can keep reviewing the diet and changing around what priorities we need to address to help that person keep moving forward. So a deficiency in one or more essential nutrients can lead to a whole cascade of events as your body, as your body adapts to conserve its precious, precious nutrient stores. So I'm going to go through some examples of different nutrients and what it can look like uh, from a day to day perspective if you are deficient or if you are heading towards a deficiency. But what I really want to highlight here is that it's not just a matter of being sufficient or deficient. It's not like an in or out sort of uh, mentality here. This is really about a sliding scale, very similar to insulin resistance. It's not like you are insulin resistant or insulin sensitive. You are on a spectrum of um, insulin resistance from super, super insulin sensitive, like think about a teenage male athlete with lots of muscle mass on the scale up to someone who has extremely poor diabetes control and blood sugar management. We're all somewhere in the middle when it comes to insulin sensitivity. And the same is true for our nutrient status. Some of us are extremely deficient in certain fatty acids and certain proteins, certain vitamins and minerals, and some of us are extremely sufficient in those things, but then others are on the spectrum somewhere. You know, we might be heading towards a deficiency and our body still might be sending us signs and signals that something needs to change. Your body is very smart and your body is always trying to keep its essential nutrients in the body. So if it senses that one or more of its essential nutrients are dipping towards a deficiency, it's going to change. Okay, so there is a huge long list of vitamins and minerals and proteins and fats that our body needs. And what you might have seen before in a food label is something called the RDI or the recommended daily intake. The government has set some requirements, so some suggested requirements for us for a lot of these macro and micronutrients, um, trying to help us prevent deficiency, but also trying to help us reduce our risk of disease. Um, a lot of it is really good science, a lot of it isn't, <laughs> but I think it is useful to have this, uh, these RDI, so to speak, or these adequate intakes or the suggested dietary targets. I mean, it's better than nothing. And it can help people identify roughly how much they need each day, but by no means are these nutrient reference values optimal for every single person because it's population-based science. And what we really need for these vitamins and minerals is individual science, an individual assessment to see, you know, what are your individual unique requirements? How much is your body absorbing from food? How much is your body losing through daily activities, stresses, uh, medications, and other things like that? So really, I want you to think about there being minimal intakes, which is usually what we hear from the population-based advice and nutrient reference values, and then optimal intakes. Intakes that can leave you feeling amazing and living to your full potential. All right, so let's start with protein. I'm gonna give a few different examples, but I'm not going to go through all of them because we would be here all day. So I'm going to give some of the more common examples that I see in my practice in terms of people not eating enough, uh, particularly women. All right, so protein. Protein is an essential macronutrient. Protein is really, really important as a building block in our body. So for building our hormones, for building, building our connective tissue, for helping keep our bones nice and strong um, and muscles and so much more. So when people come in and they're telling me that they have trouble increasing muscle mass or they feel weak or they've noticed muscle wasting 
And that's not just older adults, guys. That could be younger people as well who are noticing that their body composition is changing and they're losing muscle mass, which is turning into fat, even though they're not necessarily changing too much in terms of their weight on the scale. Um, it still could be an indicator they're not getting enough protein. Increased susceptibility to leaky gut. So leaky gut is a hot new term right now. And it basically means when the integrity of your gut lining is impacted in a negative way. So when the sort of tight junctions that hold the barrier of your gut together kind of split apart or get little tiny holes or tears in them. And that's when nutrients or um, not even really nutrients because that wouldn't matter if they got through to the blood, but things that we don't want getting through to the blood inside the body get into the body through this leaky gut. And that can lead to a whole cascade of inflammatory events because your gut is like your immune system, right? It's the barrier from the outside to the inside. So if it's leaky, that can lead to a lot of other issues. And so with leaky gut, most people are thinking, okay, what is it that's triggering my leaky gut? What is causing, uh, what food is causing my gut to be leaky? But I always like to make sure that people are getting enough protein because if you don't have enough protein, you could be on the best elimination diet in the world and your gut won't heal because your gut needs protein to heal. So skin issues, whether that be sort of sagging skin, dry skin, um, poor healing rates, uh, protein gives us collagen um, and there's a, collagen is a specific protein, I should say. And if you're not having enough protein, your body's not making enough collagen. Simple as that. Um, excessive hunger, we know that there is a sort of protein leverage hypothesis, so our body is going to eat, eat, eat until we get enough protein. Um, so actually prioritizing protein can be really useful, especially if you are trying to lose weight. Um, and then hair loss and thinning. This is so ridiculously common in women who are dieting and they put up with it because they think, well, as long as I lose weight, that's all that matters, right? You know, but your, your hair, your nails, your skin, all of these things are so important for not only your vitality and health, but for you feeling confident in your own skin, which is usually the whole reason we want to lose weight in the first place. So how much protein is adequate? So as I said, the nutrient reference values are kind of like our minimum and they're suggesting 0.75 grams per kilograms of body weight. So what would be the protein requirements for a 75 kilogram woman aged 48? It would be about 57 grams of protein a day. Now that's not 57 grams of fish or 57 grams of chicken. This is 57 grams of actual protein. So within a 100 gram steak or 100 gram piece of chicken, there's around 30 grams of protein. Um, but I've actually calculated what, a, what this would look like if you broke it down into individual foods. So you can see whether or not you think 57 grams is easy to achieve or not. So it would be three whole eggs, one small can of tuna and 80 grams of cooked beef. If you kind of spread this across three meals, you might be thinking, I, I get that every day. I get more than that. Or you might be thinking, oh, when I have eggs, I only have one. I don't have three. I would be too full. A uh, can of tuna? Yeah, yeah, I might have a can of tuna, but sometimes I just have a vegetarian salad and I don't have protein. Same with dinner. Sometimes you would have that amount of beef, but other times maybe not. But remember I said, this is the absolute minimum. So I really do hope people are meeting this. And if they aren't, that could lead to serious health consequences if it's kept up for a long period of time. But let's go to what a more ideal amount would be for a person who is 48 years old, so the same woman, 48 years old, 75 kilograms. But let's take into account the fact that she is under a lot of stress. And let's also take into account she has low bone density and a high risk for osteoporosis and she's exercising every single day. 
this woman needs more than 0.75 grams per kilogram. I estimate that she needs between 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight, which actually equates to 90 to 115 grams of protein per day. And so what that looks like across the day, so for brekkie, she might have as her protein source, she might have three whole eggs and 50 grams of cheese, make a nice big satiating omelet. For her lunch, she might have the can of tuna again, but she might also add 50 grams of mixed nuts to bump the protein up. And then for dinner, we're looking at a much more generous serving of beef, 150 grams of cooked beef. And she's meeting her protein requirements that way. So you can see how there is such a huge difference between what is the minimal amount, what is the absolute minimum. And unfortunately in clinic, I see a lot of women not even meeting the minimum. And then what is the optimal amount? And we don't use protein as a fuel. A lot of people are so concerned about calories and so worried about overeating calories. But if your calories bump up because you're getting more protein, you're not going to be storing those calories as fat. You're going to be using those protein calories to help your body get stronger, to help your muscles grow, to help your skin be more plump and collagenous, and to help your joints have more cushion between the joints so you don't get arthritis. So there's so many useful functions for protein, and I think it really needs to be prioritized. Omega-3 fats. So you may or may not have heard of these before. You probably have. We often talk about omega-3 fats as being anti-inflammatory. But these are essential fats. Our body cannot make them. We must get them through the diet. And if you have a deficiency or you're not getting enough omega-3 fats, it can lead to things like poor cognitive health. So memory loss, forgetting people's names, not being as quick in the head, even mood changes, depression, uh, just periods of low mood, if you don't want to call it depression, inflammatory skin conditions, dermatitis, general inflammation like joint inflammation, gut inflammation. And then coming to our cardiovascular risk profile, so many of us are worried about cardiovascular risk. And that's absolutely understandable given it's such a common condition today and most of us have it in our family. Um, but omega-3 fats, if we're not getting enough of them, they can be something that lead to low HDL cholesterol and high triglycerides, which we know is a strong risk factor for heart disease when these things are in the suboptimal range. And so if only we could just bump up these omega-3 fats maybe so many of these things we're seeing on the screen could be improved. So how much do we actually need? It's a bit more difficult to find a recommended daily intake based on solid science for the omega-3 fats, because what we see in a lot of the research is that omega-3 fats have therapeutic benefits, which means depending on um, you know, what sort of condition you have or your background, Bumping up omega-3 fats can be very, very useful, but our individual requirements are so, so different. So basically, I've used the global organization, um, the EPA DHA omega-3 recommendation, and, um, and that is 500 milligrams. So 500 milligrams of EPA DHA combined. And that would equal across the week because oftentimes we don't eat fish every single day or we don't eat seafood every single day. Um, so 500 milligrams of EPA DHA across the week would be 3,500 milligrams. And so let's see how much fish that would be across the week. So 100 grams of oily fish is 1,500 milligrams. So we'd need 250 grams of oily fish per week. Now, some of you might be thinking, wow, how easy is that? I eat that, you know, I have salmon every day or whatever it might be. And that's fantastic. But so many people I see do not eat fish on a regular basis. And I must say, you know, there's many weeks that I go and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I haven't had fish in so long. It's so easy to fall out of the habit 
of knowing what foods our bodies need. And yes, there are other foods that contain these EPAs and DHAs, but nowhere near the amount that oily fish and seafood has. So it's about thinking about your own intake and thinking, do I have fish two to three times every single week? Am I getting this minimum recommendation for reducing my risk of cardiovascular disease and preventing some of those things on the previous page? And for a lot of my clients who are dealing with high amounts of inflammation, because we know that omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, if you've got a lot of inflammation in your system, then you want to meet that inflammation with anti-inflammatory strategies. So it's quite possible that you might benefit from increasing your omega-3s even further, whether that be through food or a supplement. All right, so sodium. Most people don't even realize that sodium is an essential nutrient because we have been told to stop adding salt at the table and to choose low sodium foods. And I think this is so unfortunate because when I assess my clients' diets, most people are consciously going out of their way to avoid this essential nutrient while every single day experiencing symptoms of sodium deficiency. And these are things as common as headaches, dizziness when you stand up, fatigue, excessive thirst, just drinking so much water and not being able to quench your thirst, sugar and salty cravings, even the after dinner snack time, or before dinner snack time is where you just open everything in the cupboard and you just keep, keep, keep reaching for foods and you can't seem to stop yourself. Or you're spending hours during that work meeting just thinking about lunchtime, just craving bread, craving potato chips, reaching for the lolly bowl. It could be a sodium deficiency. And digestive upset. I've recently started working at a gastroenterology clinic and I'm seeing so many clients, all ages, dealing with immense digestive problems, digestive issues that are affecting their quality of life. And for a lot of these people, it can be as simple as cracking more salt on their meals. And when you are very low in sodium, when the body is trying to conserve its sodium stores because it's not getting enough through the diet, insulin resistance actually goes up to help the body hold on to sodium. And we know that when insulin resistance goes up, that means we have higher amounts of insulin in the body and insulin is our fat storage hormone. So not eating enough salt can actually lead to weight gain. Crazy, right? So how much salt do we actually need? So this one is so interesting because just even the idea of thinking I need a certain amount of salt every day is crazy for some people. But when you take into account that most whole foods don't actually contain much sodium at all, and even a lot of packaged foods these days are sodium reduced. Then if you kind of add this up across the day, it's easy to see that you're not getting much sodium at all. And this 2000 milligrams per day target is actually the government target. So it's on the nutrient reference values. This is the target that even the government says we should be aiming for, right? And just have a think with this example, whether or not you're actually reaching this minimum target of 2000 milligrams of sodium a day. So salt and sodium is not the same thing. You can see here that half a teaspoon of salt equals 1000 milligrams of sodium. So half a teaspoon of salt, you know, stop this recording now, go measure out half a teaspoon of salt and see whether or not that looks like a lot of salt to you or not much salt at all. But that's only getting you halfway there. Cheese is a really good source of sodium. So 50 grams of cheese is gonna help bump you up some more small can of tuna, tuna fish, seafood, that's quite salty. So that's going to help bump you up a little bit more. 
and then a slice of good old prosciutto, which is super, super sodium rich, can help bump you up to that 2000 milligrams a day. Now you might've noticed that this sodium target is for someone who's sedentary, not stressed, not drinking lots of coffee, not on any medications, because a lot of those things I just listed actually mean your sodium requirements are higher in order to process stress, process medications, in order for your body to recover after an exercise session, you need to replace sodium that you have lost throughout the day. Otherwise, your body's going to start those adaptive processes to try and hold onto it. So we have a human sodium set point, which is more so around 3000 to 4000 milligrams a day. So that's how much our body needs each day. And if we lose it, we need to replace it. Um, and you might even need more sodium than this. If you are someone who is doing a lot of exercise, like you're training for two, three hours a day. Um, if you're sweating a lot, if it's hot and you're just a hot, you're excessive sweater, you probably need more sodium. Um, if you're dehydrated, so you're working out in the heat or, um, you're an older adult who's been stuck without being able to hydrate yourself with food and water. You may need more sodium. If you've got inflammatory gastrointestinal issues and you're not absorbing sodium as well, you might also need more. And if you're on a low carb diet, it actually means you're more likely to lose sodium from your body. So your sodium requirements are higher. And I don't know if you know or have heard of the myth that when you drink a cup of coffee, you have to have a glass of water too. Every cup of coffee, coffee dehydrates you by one cup of water. I've seen that in so many health clinics, it's not even funny. But caffeine depletes you of sodium. And if you are depleted in sodium, what your body's going to try and do is push the water out of your system to help maintain your sodium fluid balance in the body. So it's not really water that um, needs to be replaced when you're having coffees, it's salt. So 3000 to 4000 milligrams of sodium is the equivalent of 1.5 to two teaspoons of salt. And again, measure this out and have a look and see whether or not you actually think you're meeting that across the day because one and a half to two teaspoons of salt is a lot of salt. I must admit, I find it difficult to do this every single day. And so of course you can use salty foods like prosciutto, you can use bone broth, things like that to help you meet your sodium requirements for the day. But this is something you need to do every single day and you need to reassess because each day is different, right? You might have a more stressful day and it might lead you to having a headache or it might lead you to having GI upset, bloating, pain. And what I want you to start thinking is that stress isn't the cause of those things. Stress has depleted your sodium, sodium levels and you need to replace your sodium losses and therefore you'll be able to prevent or treat those signs and symptoms as opposed to just saying, oh, I've got a headache, I'm stressed, nothing I can do about it. There's always something you can do. And there's plenty of others. So magnesium, vitamin D, folate, vitamin B12, and so, so many more nutrients that when we're deficient or when we're dipping low, we experience different signs and symptoms. And so many of these issues are just so common not getting enough sleep, numbness, tingling in the hands and the feet, migraines, chronic pain, low bone density, anxiety, poor detox pathways, being off balance and feeling like you're always going to trip over. That could be a serious vitamin B12 deficiency. And look, there's, there's so many, we don't need to go into all of them. Um, but it's so important. We ask the question, are we getting enough of our essential nutrients. But how do we know? How do we know where to get the nutrients our body needs? It is my job every single day to spend hours with individuals analyzing their signs and symptoms against the evidence that we have available 
analyzing their dietary intake, checking their supplements, checking their medications to see whether or not they might be deficient or needing more of certain vitamins or minerals. But it is my job to do this and we shouldn't all be expected to know how to do this for ourselves. So how do we know where to get the nutrients our body needs? All right, I want to introduce you to the good old Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. The Australian Guide to Healthy Eating was actually designed to help us meet our essential nutrients. So if we get X servings of breads and cereals, X servings of veggies, X servings of fruit, X servings of calcium products, um, dairy, sorry, and X servings of the lean meats, then for our age, um, we are going to meet, probably, we are most likely going to meet our essential proteins, our essential fats, and our essential micronutrients. And it's actually a good idea. So doing it in such a way that's food focused as opposed to like numbers focused is really, really useful. So if you know I need to get, you know, five servings of veggies today and that's going to help you meet lots of your essential micronutrients, it can be something easy that everybody can follow. The problem is, however, that not everyone wants or needs to follow a high carbohydrate diet. The Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is based on a diet of 45 to 60 percent total energy from carbohydrate. And that's because the largest servings come from the breads and cereals group. So we're told to eat upwards of five servings, six, seven, eight servings of grains and cereals every single day to help us meet our essential nutrients. And it's not that these foods are overly nutrient dense, but these foods are fortified. So they've, been, they've had essential vitamins and minerals like B vitamins added to them, iron added to them, sodium added to them to help the population meet their intakes. Now, you could argue that that's a great thing. You know, we're being, <laughs> we're being given this opportunity to help us get our vitamins and minerals. But if you have to get your vitamins and minerals through breads and cereals, other areas of your diet can suffer, particularly if you're insulin resistant and you're carbohydrate intolerant. And to me, I see fortified food products as supplements. To me, they're not really healthy whole foods. They're not natural sources of vitamins and minerals. And that leads to my next problem because these nutrients aren't always natural or bioavailable. What that kind of means is that they either don't get absorbed or they do get absorbed, but they don't do the right thing in your body. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a lot of wheat products, actually in Australia, most wheat products are fortified with something called folic acid. Now, most people think of folic acid, they've taken it through pregnancy and they know it's essential. Folic acid is actually the synthetic form of folate. And for a lot of people, it's completely harmless taking folic acid because their body will convert the folic acid to folate just fine. But for just as many people, their body isn't as good at converting folic acid to the activated form of folate that we actually need. And this can lead to harmful effects if folic acid is eaten in high amounts and it's building up in our body. The excessive intake of folic acid can be an issue and then the fact that we're not actually getting enough folate because we're relying on these folic acid foods or supplements could make that could lead to a folate deficiency, sorry. And so we have to think of the bioavailability of nutrients and not just the nutrient content of foods. And so that would be my second problem with this Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. And then that leads us nicely into problem number three, because some of the most nutrient dense foods are restricted or not even included on this food list. If you know me in any kind of way, you will know that I promote liver to almost everybody 
because it is like the best micronutrient supplement you could ever take. It just has so many essential nutrients in it that most people are lacking in. And the funny thing is that liver doesn't even appear on this list and it doesn't appear as something that the government is trying to promote and get people to consume. And the other thing is that fats are restricted on this list. So healthy sources of fats like butters and olive oils and coconut oil and macadamia nut oil and things that can give us really good essential fat soluble vitamins we're actually told to use them in small amounts. And when you do a nutrient analysis of all the different foods we have, the whole foods we have available in our food supply, you can see that so many things are missing from this guide. Some researchers and I at the University of Sydney are looking into how we can help individuals who are wanting to follow a low carbohydrate diet in actually meeting their essential nutrients. So what foods should they focus on? Can we develop some resources to help people out? Because I think the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating is a good idea. I think it's clear, I think it's simple, but it doesn't suit a lot of individuals, especially people who are following a low carbohydrate diet and basing their diet on mostly whole foods and not fortified processed foods. So as I said, the general population based advice is insufficient. And a lot of the times we hear things online, we read things in the headline, um, we see things in the headline and you know, even hear things from our doctors. And we have to remember this is population level advice and it doesn't necessarily suit the individual. Healthcare professionals trained in estimating nutrient requirements and conducting nutrient analyses are currently the best resource that we have. So actually going to see someone who can assess you on an individual basis and ask you the right questions to find out what it is your body needs and what your requirements for certain nutrients are. And then also be able to look at your diet and ask the question, are you getting enough? Do you need more? How can we help you get more? So at the moment, that one-on-one -on -one support is really the best thing we have. But because I do this every day as a job, I see common themes in how, uh, common themes in what I need to formulate for people, what sort of a dietary approach I need to formulate to help them reach their essential proteins, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. And most of us think that all of those things come from vegetables, but it's actually animal proteins where you get a lot of these essential nutrients. So my tips for increasing nutrient density in the diet, even if you haven't had an individualized nutrient analysis done, would be number one, to prioritize animal proteins. So meat, fish, eggs, dairy, and organ meats. Organ meats, as I said before, are just up the top of the scale for most essential vitamins and even some minerals as well. Um, and organ meats can be used in so many different ways. You can make liver pate, as I said. Um, you can mix it into mincemeat. You can hide it in things like sausages. You know, you can find ways to make it work if you don't love the taste of plain organ meats. Um, but even just meat, fish, eggs, dairy, these are things that so many people are restricting or so many people feel as if there needs to be a, a max portion where they sort of just limit themselves from having too much. But, you know, with these foods being so densely packed with nutrients and also these foods are low in carbohydrate, right? So they're not necessarily going to send your insulin levels through the roof, but probably more importantly, they're going to give you those ingredients for your body to function and thrive. And if your body is getting all the ingredients it needs, it's going to be so much easier to reach your goals if one of them is weight loss. Um, and then tip number two, don't skimp on healthy fats. So even within the low carb, high fat realm where we are more fat loving, I still notice that a lot of people are worried about adding fat to their meals. 
um, and they're really restricting their fat or concerned about how much they're eating. And I get it because, you know, we've been so ingrained to think that fat is bad and fat is going to make us fat. And even if we jump into a low carb, high fat diet, it can take us many years to really accept fat as being something that isn't going to make us fat. So I completely understand. But as I alluded to before, fat rich foods and even just plain fats and oils like olive oil um, and butter and coconut oil and lard and things like that, they contain a lot of essential fat soluble vitamins. And they also help sort of slow the digestion of other foods like non-starchy veggies in the gut. So your body can absorb more nutrients out of those. So you get more bang for your buck from a nutrient density perspective if you're adding lots of healthy fats to your meals. And, you know, usually I tell people to go based on their satiety. So, you know, just eat fat to satiety. And that's what a lot of the research suggests as well. But some people need a little bit of a helping hand and a little bit of a guide with portions. You know, how much should I eat? Um, and so generally, if you're adding about two tablespoons of fats to your meal, as probably a minimum for most people, that's going to really help you get your fats in for the day and absorb your nutrients for the day. And then the third, maybe even most important point is adding salt and even sometimes measuring out your salt for the day and trying to titrate it against some of the symptoms you might be experiencing. Whole foods don't naturally contain high amounts of sodium. So those whole foods that we tend to prioritize on a low carb, high fat diet don't always have the sodium that we need for optimal function. So it is about thinking, you know, how do I feel when I add more salt to my diet? And is that something I need to try and keep up and remind myself to do every single day? And these are three really simple tips that you may or may not be doing now. And you may want to play around with different amounts of animal proteins, different types of animal proteins. Same with fats, play around with the different types of fats available and scale up and down on your fat intake to see where you feel best and track the symptoms that are important to you. And the same with salt. I can't emphasize enough how much my clients' lives change when they finally get the right sodium balance in their body and they finally build their diet with the right amounts of these three things. So I wanna say thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this talk really enjoyable. It's definitely a passion of mine, helping individuals address their physiology with nutrition and letting that allow you to achieve food freedom. So the idea here isn't that we get now even more bogged down about how much we need to eat or what we need to eat, because the way we can get our essential nutrients is a lot more simple than we think. It's about finding someone who can help you work through that. And I know for a lot of people, we're all at different stages. And for a lot of people, some of the things I've been speaking about today, it's just beyond what they want to do right now. You know, you might just be only getting your head around what is a carbohydrate and what is a fat and what is a protein. And now I'm opening up your mind to all these other nutrients that you have to think about as well. And I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed or confused. So what we've done at Ellipse Health is we've created a starter pack, so to speak, for addressing your physiology and building a healthy relationship with food to achieve what we call food freedom. And this is an automated starter pack. It's a program that you can go through at any time at your own pace online. And so if you want to dive a little bit more deeper into this and get some resources to help you get your essential vitamins and minerals and proteins and fatty acids in, then this is a really good toolkit for you. But if you wanna just reach out and ask me a question or connect with me online, please don't hesitate to do so. I'd love to hear about your own stories and about your own experiences. 
And um, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you so much for listening.